What's up? My name's John Melton, been in the network marketing profession now for 20 years. I can't believe it. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, it's the greatest profession on the planet. Obviously, I know I'm biased, but show me an industry, show me a job or a business that you can get into where the more you work on yourself, the more money you make. And it's all about character development and personal development. Like most professions, they don't talk about personal development. Most professions, most jobs, most careers, they don't talk about growing yourself and uh, becoming the best version of yourself. And that's what I love about what we do, right? It's all about growing you if you wanna grow your business and your bank account. I'm gonna share three lessons that I've learned over the last 20 years. Shots fired, I'm not taking shots at anybody. I, I'm just speaking from 20 years in the profession. I've seen, like I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've seen companies come and go over the years and I've seen network marketers come and go over the years and it's a shame. There's some really good people that have gotten involved in this profession. They had a bad experience, probably multiple bad experiences and you know, maybe they, they dealt with some narcissism. Right? Maybe they dealt with some uh, some some crappy companies. Maybe, you know, my last company got shut down by the FTC, you know? So you have enough bad experiences and you just throw your hands up, you're like, I'm done. Like, I just, this isn't, this isn't for me. You know, maybe it's not meant to be. Maybe, uh, you know, I, I, I'm meant to do something else or, you know, I'll just stick to what I know. How many of us know people like that? And I can tell you, I got involved in network marketing in 2001. The profession was very, very different back then. I never really thought I would be a millionaire. I never thought I would be successful. You know, truth is, how many of us can relate to this? When I went to school, it was all about go to school, get a degree, get a job, work for somebody else. And the problem was I hated school. I would fall asleep in class all the time. Anyone else like me? I was a total rebel. I got expelled my senior year for fighting. Oh yeah, I got in tons of fist fights all the time. Like. You know, I was either chasing girls or getting in a fight on the weekends. Like in, in school, I got in a lot of fights and got suspended. And like I said, I got expelled my senior year. Now, luckily I got back in. I ended up doing uh, night school and not playing my senior year of high school baseball, unfortunately, because I had to do night school because I wanted to graduate on time with my buddies. I was trouble. I was headed down the wrong path. And I heard Grant Cardone say one time, he said that he got hooked on drugs. And he said the reason he got hooked on drugs is because he was bored. And I'm like, amen, that was me. Like I was just bored, there, there was no inspiration. There was, there was nothing I was excited about. And I definitely wasn't excited to go to school and get a job, plus I didn't have any money to go to college. My parents didn't have any money. So the whole college thing just didn't, it wasn't really exciting to me. And um, the month before I turned 21, I came to a network marketing meeting. They had me hook, line, and sinker. I was, dude, I was a red, you know the apples? They talk about red apples, green apples, and rotten apples, okay? I was a red apple. I was like, dude. Residual income sounds amazing. Residual income sounds, I want beach money. I want to make money while I'm at the beach. I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Everybody's going to join. Everybody's going to be so fired up. When I showed them this, your mind's going to be blown. And then of course I go home and I, I tell my parents and they're like, mm. um, you know, there's no internet back then, or at least I, we didn't, I didn't have a computer in my house. I know most people didn't have access to the internet back then. So you can go like, there's no Googling, right? But you start talking to people and they're like, oh, is that like Amway? That's a pyramid scam. That's this, that's this. And, and you know, I, have, I had some friends that would come to the meetings and some of them would join, but some of them would go back and they would start telling the other guys, don't. Don't go to that that thing that that Melton and Callahan are doing. Like that's it's a freaking pyramid scheme. It's one of the it's one of those scams and all this. And for a lot of people, they probably would have been like, "Oh, my friends." I was like, you know what? Screw you guys. Like because I think for me, because I didn't like it was actually a good thing that I hated school and I didn't want to go off to college and I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So many of my friends, they were going to school. You know, they they like were going to get a degree to get a job to work for somebody else, and I just because I think I didn't want to go down that path, it was easier for me to be like, nah, I'm going to do this. And they were motivating me. It was like fuel for my fire. But I'm also like the red personality, the shark. So I would literally, and this is back in my drinking days, I would go out drinking with my buddies and literally, I mean, I'd black out a lot of times, like bad stuff. And I would literally, I remember Callahan and I, we would like, we would go to, we would do our meeting and we'd be wearing a suit and tie. I'm wearing some cheap suits, some cheap tie. And then I'd like go out, we'd go out to the bars and we're like, instead of me getting girls' numbers, I'm getting guys' numbers because I'm going to recruit them. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, literally, we would have we would have conversations at the bar or at parties trying to recruit 
guys to join our business. Now we would try to recruit women too, but it was a lot of like, you know, we're 22, 21, like, you know, so you're like hanging out with your boys. And I remember there'd be some nights, I still have some of these like memories burned in my mind of us like going out drinking and I get into arguments with some of my really good friends, like, like almost fist fighting over like me trying to get them in and me trying to convince them that it's a real business. And by the way, that first company, it kind of was a pyramid scheme. So sometimes people get upset. They're like, how dare you? I didn't know it. But like, if you actually look at your life in reverse, sometimes things make more sense. And when I look back, a lot of my friends were right. That was a pyramid because we would recruit people and then we'd get them to buy inventory. So we'd help people get a loan or extend their credit card and they're buying thousands of dollars in product because you got to have inventory. There's definitely a problem in network marketing when you're pushing inventory. But the funny thing is, if you started a traditional business, I think you would need inventory. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that I, I agree with that model, but like if you bought a restaurant, you need some food, you need some like plates and silverware. Like it is funny how people go, I was scammed out of $5,000. It's like, well, yeah, but you were also maybe a little dumb, a little naive, a little uncoachable, right? Like you invested $5,000 and you lost it. That sucks, but go start a traditional business. It's going to cost you a lot more than $5,000. So the thing that really helped me those first two years, even though looking back, most of our volume did come from the distributors, I learned a lot. I learned things that I didn't know I needed to learn. You know, it's funny. How many of us have noticed? Isn't it funny how they don't teach us about money and credit and things that are most important? But as you learn these things, especially in network marketing and being in business, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. That's what's crazy, right? Like the more you start following really successful people, really intelligent people, really, you know, business minded people, the more you learn, the more you realize you need to learn, if that makes sense. So I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. And as I learned to be an entrepreneur, a leader, a boss, a, you know, a business person. Um, and even though that company went out of business and I felt like my friends were right. My friends were right. Like, I'm going to go get a real job. I'm going to go get a real job. And there's more to that story. And I don't want to waste your time with all that. But, you know, Nadia and I ended up obviously together through that company. We moved to Colorado to go work with Michelle Barnes and build this other business. We go out to Colorado. And unfortunately, my dad dies of a heart attack back in Maryland, where I live now. But at the time I was in Colorado, still worst phone call I've ever gotten in my life, obviously. Um, and then a month later, we're pregnant. Surprise. So, you know, we're out there waiting tables. We're doing some other network marketing company that we never really did much with. We were kind of still like really disgruntled from our last company getting shut down, kind of followed people. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, I'm like, okay, I'm having a baby. Like we need to get serious. Uh, we need to get real jobs. And it was funny because I dropped out of community college, as you know, Nadia had two degrees. So I'd always say Nadia has got two degrees, one for each of us. But um, She's getting hired at all these like AmeriQuest, Countrywide, all these mortgage companies are hiring her. And it's like all dudes. And they wouldn't hire me because I didn't have a college degree. And I'm like, first of all, I'm not a jealous person, but nah. Like Nadia is not going to work in this like sweatshop with like all these guys and they're not going to hire me. That's not, that's just weird. And even she was like, this is uncomfortable. This is like, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about this. And, um, I still remember this one office specifically. It was like all these like meathead dudes and, you know, whatever. It, it is what it is. But I was just like, uh, what? so you're going to hire my, my, at the time, my girlfriend and not me. Uh, yeah, no, we're not, we're, not, we're not doing that. And in addition to that, we're having a baby. We need help. So we actually moved back to Maryland after living in Colorado for like six or seven months, which I loved Colorado, but we moved back to Maryland. And uh, there was this guy. So I recruited his girlfriend. And when she came to the meeting, she brought Tom, her boyfriend, and Tom was driving an Escalade. And Tom dropped out of an Ivy League school to do mortgages. Now, truth be told, again, I didn't know what mortgages were. Nobody ever shared with me what a freaking mortgage was. How am I supposed to know? You don't know what you don't know. So I knew nothing about a mortgage. But uh, he's like, listen, I like you. I like your mindset. He goes, I bet you, you would crush it in the mortgage industry. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I need to get a real job. So we move back to Maryland. I meet with Tom. Tom's like, dude, you got to meet Dave Silverman, the owner of National Fidelity Mortgage. And I still, to this day, I'm so grateful for Tom and Dave Silverman, Tom Free, Dave Silverman, because they gave me an opportunity when no one else would. So I get a job at a mortgage company in Baltimore. And I, I even said in the interview to Dave, I said, listen, Dave, um, I'm all about it. I'm all about making money. I'll outwork everybody in your office. I told him that. 
I said, I will outwork everybody in your office, which by the way, lesson number one, work your face off. No excuses. One thing that I learned, no excuses. It, whatever your situation is, anytime you whine, anytime you complain, when you complain, you remain. So when you whine and complain, your results are going to be congruent with your lack of, of, of uh, tenacity, your lack of, of, you know, I'm going to figure this out. Yes, it's hard. Obviously, it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would be rich. Everybody would be successful. And by the way, if it's easy, it's typically sleazy. Okay? Okay. So my first year, I was a rookie of the year and one of the top 10 loan officers. I made $125,000. And so I was still 22. I'm 22 years old, making 10 Gs a month. No college education. By the way, out earning all of my friends out earning all of my friends that have college degrees. So I hope that doesn't come off as cocky or arrogant. I'm just saying I outworked most people. So the whole, like, you got to have a degree to be successful, obviously ridiculous, ridiculous notion. Does a college degree help you if you want to be an accountant? Yes. If you want to be a lawyer, you got to go to law, law school. I mean, there's certain professions, but to be in business, to be in sales. In fact, if somebody were to say, hey, I want to get into business, what's the first thing I should do? I'm like, get into sales. You need to know how to sell. 100% you need to know how to sell. So I get into to mortgages, rookie of the year. I out, so they would pull up the call logs every week. I made more phone calls than anybody every single week. So my question to you is, are you ATMing more people than everybody else? Long story short, every week they would show up the call logs. And I remember Dave said in the interview, if you make 100 calls a day, you will make six figures. And I just believed him. So I made 100 calls a day. Every week, my call log would ever for 500 outbound calls. You know how many other people? If you had to guess, how many other people do you think made over 100 calls a day like me? Over 500 a week, if you had to guess. You already know the answer. <laughs> None. And then eventually, they took me out of a cubicle and I got my own office because I was the, one of the top mortgage bankers that first year. And I literally, I'd have a phone. I had the, like the earpiece. You know what I'm saying? The earpiece is just a tap. And I'd be like, I'm on the phone. I'm always on the phone. They would make fun of me because I would have my earpiece on and I would walk from my office to the bathroom and I'm talking on the phone while I'm going to the bathroom. I'm not kidding. Why? Because I don't waste time. I'm a freak when it comes to efficiency. I don't waste time. Like I want to talk to you, figure out if I can uh, solve a problem, if I can help you, if I can benefit you, if I can't, I move on. And I do it in the most polite way, the most like, you know, like I I'm, I'm not burning bridges and I'm not like, rushing people. I don't have commission breath, but at the end of the day, I'm not wasting my time. And sometimes I would lie. Just being honest, I would lie. I would say I'm on the phone because I don't want to talk to people. I am there to work. I don't get on social media as an example. So if we were to translate that in today's terms, I'm on social media to make money, to make money. And like outside of like follow-ups, responding to group chats, responding to leads, you know, doing the, the phase one money-making activities. The other thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm, congratulating my teammates. I'm responding to leaders. I'm responding to people that need help, right? I am on there to make money. Some of y'all are on social media scrolling, wasting time. And these little things, these little daily disciplines, these little mistakes, as Jim Rohn would say, errors in judgment. You're making mistakes every day or you're doing the, it's kind of like working out, right? Like you could work out today, look in the mirror. You're gonna look the same. You could work out for a week. Every day, look in the mirror. You're probably going to look the same even after a month, right? Like it's, it's just chipping away. It's, it's just daily improvements, right? You're chipping away every day. So long story short, the second year I was the number one loan officer in that mortgage company, number one in a very large mortgage company in Baltimore. The next year I was again, the number one loan officer, not because I was smarter. I mean, I did figure some things out, but the truth is I outworked everyone in that company for four years. I made $600,000 as a community college dropout. And guys, I got a funny story for you. One time I'm doing a meeting. And back then, uh, Vera, Nadia's sister was involved. So Vera, you know, she's really pretty. She'd be on, you know, online, like in chat rooms and stuff. And she would like meet people and she'd invite them to these meetings we would do. And we did this one meeting and this guy comes out. And clearly he thought like, oh, pretty girl, pretty Russian girl. Let me go to this meeting, check out this business. So a presentation happens and I sit down afterwards with this guy, right? And I'm pretty aggressive, you can imagine, pretty aggressive. And I'm just like, hey man, you know, great to meet you. Would you like best? Did you see an opportunity for yourself? And he's like, nah, you know, he's like being kind of like, like you can just tell he's, he's one of those rotten apples. 
And I'm like, okay, okay, cool. And, you know, we're talking. And I basically, at some point, it brought up that I made $250,000 that year in my job. And I'm doing this on the side. And he's like, you're a liar. You don't even have an MBA. That's what he says to me. He's telling me I'm lying about my freaking job. So, you know, I'm a little bit like, you know, proud of what I've created and what I've done. I'm like, you don't know me. You know what I'm saying? So, so I said, uh, no, I do have an MBA. I have a massive bank account. <laughs> and he, uh, he steps back from the table, right? He just does this like, kung fu thing. It's like ready to fight me. And like the music's playing because you always got to have music playing in meetings, right? Because you always might get a rotten apple and you don't want the, the red apples and the green apples to hear the rotten apples. So we always had the music up. So I look over at the one and I go, turn the music up. Like this guy was pissed. But it was funny because next to me is this guy, Jeff, one of our upline. He's like trying to close this person. So as he's trying to close his person, he's kind of like looking over like, what is happening, John? You know, one of those those crazy things that you just will never forget. And that's that's old school offline network marketing. And I can tell you that we've come a long way since then. And, you know, some of the lessons that I've learned over the years and, and you know, I'll give you that first lesson because I think that first lesson trumps them all. Now, of course, there's working smarter and having systems. You know, I feel bad when I when I talk to these leaders in other companies that are like exhausted because they're doing Zooms every night and they're doing three way calls all the time and they're doing all this stuff like pitching people on the business. And I feel sorry for them because I used to do that stuff. And in fact, it was much worse back then because I would drive two hours one way in rush hour traffic to go do a 630 PBR, a private business reception to pitch people on a business. And then literally we would time it perfectly. The meeting would go from 630 to 715. You're out the door by 730 because you need 15 minutes to close people. You're out the door by 730 driving 45 minutes to a meeting that's at 830. And that's just on a Monday night. Y'all. Talk about sacrifice, talk about commitment. Because when I hear people complain, and like I said, when you complain, you remain, right? People making excuses, feeling sorry for themselves. It's like, listen, so you did a curiosity post and nobody responded. You did some referral posts and you didn't get results. You're doing TikToks and nobody's engaging. Are you kidding me? I used to drive two hours one way in rush hour traffic. Someone else is putting my freaking kids to bed every night. Nadia is out doing meetings in the opposite direction. And that was just Monday night. We did that Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. We'd have meetings. We'd have 40 meetings in a night and we'd go do the two biggest. I do the two biggest. Nadia would do the second two biggest. And then we'd have all our leaders do the other meetings. Oh yeah. Living in Maryland, doing meetings in Pennsylvania, doing meetings in West Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, Virginia, DC. I mean, like literally we did meetings everywhere. Sometimes you'd even fly somewhere to go do a meeting. I've done meetings in Key West, I've done meetings in, in Europe, right? I've done meetings in, in New York City. I've done meetings in LA. I mean, I did meetings all over the world. So when people are complaining to me about how frustrated they are or their lack of results, like right now, you know, there's, there's all these holiday sales and different things that are happening and some people are killing it, some people aren't. But at the end of the day, if, you, if you're not winning, you're learning. You'll get better next time there's a promotion, next November. So this is the second lesson. You have to have long-term vision. Like the one genius thing that Nadia and I did is we didn't quit. We didn't give up. We didn't say, you know what? Enough is enough. No, there was never, and I shouldn't say there was never. There was definitely times where I was like, you know what? I got so much MLM PTSD. I just think these things, the only way to make a lot of money is to sacrifice your whole life, which by the way, not true at all. But you get to that point where you're like, I just don't think I'm cut out for this anymore. I just don't think I can look people in the eye and tell them I found a viable way to earn money from home and online. Does that make sense? I started to lose that passion and that belief. Thank God I didn't quit. Imagine if I would have given up the first seven years when I didn't earn six figures. I had a company get shut down on me, right? In those first seven years, I got out of the industry for a little while. Then I got back in, you know, and then I built that other company for seven years. My second company I built for seven years, all right? Uh, you know, I was there from 2006 to 2013 when I resigned. And then of course, when we resign and we leave, everybody's, you know, trashing us, trash talking us real, real, uh, real mature, right? Real professional. These are, these are people that did a lot of personal development and all you're getting is like either people want to join you from your previous company, which what are you going to do? What are you gonna do? When people are coming to you saying, I want to follow you into your next venture, I trust you. I respect you and Nadia. I want to work with you. Wherever you're going, we want to go too. You can't poach people, by the way. People are not eggs. And if people are happy, they're unpoachable. They're unrecruitable. I'm unrecruitable. 
I'm unrecruitable. Most of my people are unrecruitable. So the whole like, you know, scarcity mindset, being afraid of people following some other leader and joining, like, listen, people don't leave if they're happy. If they're winning, they're not leaving, right? So anyway, you get these other leaders that'll, that'll you know, and look, I get it. We're all in business together. You know, sometimes people trash talk, you know, their competition, but these people were just so ridiculous, right? Trashing us for leaving. When the truth is, do you really want people on your team that are unhappy? Do you really want people there that are just like, staying because they're loyal. No, I want my people to stay because they're happy and they're winning and they're making money. Bottom line. Now, again, you got to have long-term vision, but I was in that company for seven years, not seven months or seven weeks. You see these people that are like, well, I gave it the old college try. Uh, been here seven weeks now. This isn't for me. Like, <laughs> okay. All right, bud. You, seven weeks. Yeah. You really know what it is and what it isn't. You really know if you can be successful. I mean, seven months, seven weeks, nothing. Seven years, that's a different conversation. Seven years is a sacrifice like no other, especially when you work at full time, hundred hours a week or whatever we were putting into it with traveling and on the phone. And like, literally we were eight to faint, 8 a.m. to faint. So anyway, these people are trash talking us. And, you know, and, and again, even today you get people that trash, you know, the way we do things, the way we brand ourselves and attraction marketing, which is so cute and sad. It's so cute and sad. Why? Because how many of us sort of agree? Your people are looking for a new opportunity because they're dissatisfied. And by the way, I have people leave my team and go elsewhere. Most of the times they come back, <laughs> right? Because we don't burn a bridge and we're nice to them. They maybe get shiny ball syndrome. They go, ooh, you know, uh, electronic, what are they called? Um, magnetic lashes. Ooh. Or they see, uh, oh, these, 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 you know, this, these nails, these clip on or not clip on. I, I don't speak this language. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, this, you know, this new binary, it's going to be amazing. And then it crashes and burns. It's going to be epic. Some of you know what I'm talking about and you got that. Or some crypto BS, right? Like, good luck, but I wouldn't recommend it if you want long-term. See, some people just want to make fast cash. They're not thinking about the long-term. They don't even care about the long-term because they need money now. That I need money now mentality is scary and it's dangerous. By the way, we still have people that come in and make a lot of money fast. I'm just saying you do get people that, you know, they go somewhere else. And I just don't burn a bridge unless they're, unless they're doing something really bad. I'm not going to burn a bridge, a perfectly good relationship. And that's, again, when you're thinking long-term, back to that lesson too, when you're thinking long-term, if you're going to be doing this 5, 10, 15 years, doesn't it make sense not to burn bridges and just be a good human? Because there were people that were on my team in the past that came back around years later because they're like, John and Nadia are still at it. You know what? If I ever get back into network marketing, I'm only reaching out to John and Nadia. Like they're going to go to the people that they think give them the best chance to win that are more relatable, that are down to earth. And by the way, if they don't come to me, they probably don't relate to me. They probably relate to you or someone else. If you're planning on doing this for five years, the time is gonna pass anyway. Does it, look, do you think I care now, 20 years later, do you think I care 20 years later that it took me seven years to fire my boss and make six figures? Do you think I care now? No, I don't care at all. Do you think I care that it took me 16 years to become a millionaire? Actually, I'm glad it took so long. I'm glad it took this long. Why? Because you have more appreciation and gratitude when you know you deserve it, when you know you earned it, when you, you know what it is? There's some people that make a lot of money fast and they think that's normal. This is why you see people sometimes hop around from company to company because they think it's normal to grow quickly. They think it's normal to make a lot of money. So if they're like a year in, they're like, I'm not making a lot of money. I'm not, this isn't growing fast enough. Uh, 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 they start like tweaking, right? It's like, I gotta go somewhere else. And it's like, no, that, that means you need to get better. As soon as things slow down a little bit, they're like, oh my gosh, this isn't right. This isn't normal. Like, um, yes, it is. There's no business in the world that just grows indefinitely. Look at the biggest companies in the world, Apple, Facebook, Google, right? These massive companies, every single one of them started off slow. Every single one of them at one point was in big trouble. Like there is no business, it just goes up. You have to think like this. You have to realize that there's seasons in your business. There's seasons of growth, there's seasons of maintaining, there's seasons of like trimming the fat. But ultimately, if look, I want you to start tracking your business like a real business. So here's what I would do if I were you. Set a reminder in your phone every night before bed, you take a screenshot of your volume every night. You take a screenshot of your volume and look, I know a lot of you are in different companies and stuff, but you know, most companies have show the volume. Like, you know what your sales are. You take a screenshot every night. And then here's the most important, like uh, uh, deadlines, if you will, to pay attention to, or, or points in the month, like reference points. The seventh day of the month, 
the 14th day of the month. Write this down. This is important stuff. I'm giving you like literally million dollar information for free. Did anyone pay to be on this? Did anyone pay? See, I know when you pay, you pay attention, but I need you to pay attention to this. The 7th, 14th, 21st, and the last day of the month. Because you shouldn't get easily discouraged day to day, week to week, month to month. But you can like look at your numbers year to year. You can go, wow. So I already know. The reason I know we're having a record month and we're going to have our biggest month ever because we're way ahead of every single month we've ever had. Why? Because I knew we were ahead of it on the 7th. I knew we were ahead on the 14th. And I knew we were ahead on the 21st. Do you, do you get this? I treat it like a real business, which would be lesson number three. Treating it like a real business. Profit and loss statements, tax deductions. When people are like, is this a real business? Are you kidding me? Is this a real business? Is it a real business? Well, let me ask you this. What are the benefits of having a real business? Anybody know? What are the benefits of having a real business? Tax deductions. You can will your business, sell your business. You can work when you want with who you want. People start their own business for freedom. The problem is you get started for $400 or $700 or $1,000. Like I said before, people invest money into a business. They invest money into things and they lose money. You invest money in crypto, you lose money. Like, Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn, which is, which is winning, right? You win what not to invest in. You, win, you learn what not to do. You learn, you learn the, you know, the things you should do when considering an investment. You learn uh, what kind of businesses. I mean, like even that first company went out of business, there were things I learned, even though it went out of business and it was shut down. That sucked. But you know, because of my personal development, because I worked on myself over the years and I worked on my mindset, within 24 hours, I was like off to the next thing. Within 24 hours, like, okay, what's next? The first day I felt sorry for myself. That's okay. You can feel sorry for yourself. But at the end of the day, nobody really cares. Now, I hope that doesn't sound insensitive. It's like we're empathetic. We care. But like we all have problems. We all deal with stuff, right? We all have things happen. Like you might see someone that has great financial success. What you don't realize is they have like a really bad health issue right now. Or like they're really healthy. They're really rich. But one of their kids is like a addicted to like drugs or something, right? Like things happen. So we're all dealing with stuff. Nobody's got it all figured out. Nobody's just good on all fronts, right? So just know this is just the reality. In business, you win some, you lose some. You lose clients, you gain clients. You lose teammates, you gain teammates. You make money, you lose money. That's called life. None of us are getting out alive. This is why you got to have long-term vision. You got to work on yourself, right? You got to treat it like a business, you got to think that like, this is not going to be easy, but at least I can create financial freedom. At least there's a chance. What do they say? The average millionaire takes them 11 businesses before they finally become a millionaire. But like Mark Cuban says, you only got to do it once. So I want you to start having appreciation and gratitude for the struggle and be grateful for the adversity because all of that makes you a stronger leader.